Welcome to the rules overview for Bury Me in the Rift. For your first game, just set everything up as shown. Uh, the two map cards side by side, randomized, randomized front and back. Uh, the three monster cards here, uh, randomized front and back, left to right. Tuck uh, two mech cards under the campaign card. You can choose these or randomize them. And then uh, you want to upgrade rows on the bottom of the mech cards, all hidden. Uh, the third mech card won't be used in your campaign. You can set it aside. And then you set the campaign die to six on the game one spot and put everything else here off to the side. So the dice on the map will be your, uh, your maps, your mechs, and the values show their HP and the colors tie them to the mech cards. So the green mech will be mech A, the Osiris, the blue will be mech B, the Shiva. The monsters are kind of similarly keyed together with these meeple cube pairs. So the cube shows the monster's HP and the color ties it to its meeple on the map. So this orange meeple is the demon, which has three HP. The yellow meeple is the herald. So that's how you tell which one's which. The goal of the game is to survive five turns. The monsters are going to try to run around this map trying to destroy your buildings, which are the gray, uh, and your mechs. And uh, you are going to try to prevent that from happening. So if you survive five turns, you win the current game. Uh, monsters and mechs both have HP, which is a little heart, and movement, which is a little foot, uh, and they'll have an attack, and that will deal damage at certain ranges. Usually they damage reduces HP. Um, if buildings take damage, you put these rune cubes on them, that destroys them. And if you can't place a rune cube, or if you lose both your mechs, then you lose the whole campaign. So each turn, you go through eight steps in order. So step one, is time passes so the campaign die here gets reduced by one and if that makes it all the way to zero uh, you win step two is monsters will spawn uh, on turn one this doesn't happen so we're going to come back around to it step three is roll the monster die and advance it so you take the monster die here off this monster card move it to the next one and roll it and uh, its position uh, the position determines what type of monsters are going to spawn next, and it's going to kind of set how the AI behaves that turn. And if you're on card three, then when you advance it, it wraps back around. So then uh, step four, monsters are going to move and aim. So this is the complicated part of the game. So during the step, monsters on the map want to walk around and aim their attacks at buildings and mechs. Then later during step eight, they're actually going to resolve those attacks. So first they aim, later they resolve, and in between the player gets to try and do something about it. So how this works is the monsters operate on a simple AI. So each monster is going to pick a column it wants to go to. Uh, then it tries to go there and aim its attack from that column. So each monster's movement value is there on the card. All movement is orthogonal. So you know, one, two movement be like that on the map. And uh, every unit's attack is right beneath that. So the attacks usually deal some amount of damage at some amount of range. So for example, this one deals one damage at range one. Uh, this one here charges forward as far as it can, then deals one damage at range one. This one uh, deals damage at range six, and the little arrow means it just it travels as far as it can and it stops when it hits something. So that's that's like a projectile that goes forward in a line till it hits something. Um, if there's no little arrow like these guys, then the attack just goes exactly that many tiles. So you'll notice on some of your mechs, you know, this one is range two plus, so that would hit something exactly two tiles away, skipping everything in between. And the plus means uh, the player could decide to go more than two tiles, but it's always in a line. Uh, the ranges don't bend, so that two plus, think of it as an arc. It can go out as far as you want on either side, skipping everything until the tile you want it to hit. Um, things on the map include the building, so anything with a little yellow plus sign is a building that can be damaged. The monsters will go after those. Uh, the mountains, which are obstacles, those are invulnerable. Buildings are obstacles until they're destroyed. You can't can't walk onto them. And then water tiles. Water tiles are deadly to monsters. Uh, your mechs can go through them, can stand in them, but they can't attack from water. Um, the catch is anything flying just completely ignores water. So flying monsters can move over it, can attack from it. Flying mechs can, can stand on it and attack. Uh, so the, how do the monsters pick the column they want to go to and name their attack from? So the monster die value you rolled, that's the column that the first monster uh, wants to go to. So in this case, the orange demon wants to go to column three. And the columns go from left to right, one through six. So can he get to column three? So in this case, he's got two movement, and his attack is only range one. So first off, he can 
get to column three, but there's something in the way. Units can never be on the same space as other units. So uh, he, he can't actually move there because he'd end on a, a unit, which is not allowed. And he also doesn't have enough range with his attack to hit anything, even if he could stand there. So when a monster can't aim an attack from the column that it initially chose, it's going to seek a new one. How does it do that? So every monster pane has this little navigation stuff down here at the bottom. The one we're using each turn, it's always determined by where you put the die. So this turn we are using this monster's navigation icon. So the seek arrow shows what column to try next. So when we couldn't try column three, we'll go one column to the right and say, can he aim an attack from that column? In this case, he can't because he isn't going to go into water. Again, that's deadly to monsters. So we just keep going to the right. Can he aim an attack from this column? Yep. With two move and a range one attack, he can walk up and he will point at that building. That's where he will deal one damage during step eight. So that's monster one using the die value. Monster two uses the die value. We just keep adding one as we go down. So the yellow herald wants to go to column three, four. Can he go there and aim an attack? Remember his is goes up to six tiles. It's a projectile. So yep, he can aim that attack. He can go here or here and aim it at this building. So which tile will he go to? Again, we're going to break ties using this little navigation pane. So in this case, the first thing he'll prioritize is standing and targeting to the north. So there's only one target. And from those two tiles, he will choose the north one. So he's going to stand there, shoot his projectile. It will stop when it hits the building and destroy it. Third monster is going to use the die value. Again, we're just going to add one for every card we go over. So this guy used three, this guy used four, he's going to use five. Can he get to column five and aim an attack? So if he goes to column five and tries to charge forward, he's going to hit a monster. Monsters will not aim at directly at other monsters. They will also not get in the way of other monsters that have already aimed their attacks uh, in such a way that they would change what they're going to hit. He's not going to step in front of this projectile. Uh, so since he can't get to column five and successfully hit something, again, we're going to use this seek arrow from the currently active navigation pane. So we'll try column six. Not enough movement to get over there. He's only got two movement. Uh, so we wrap around to column one. Can this guy get here? Yep. The Red Titan has two movement. He can walk over there because his attack is going to charge forward as far as it can, then deal one damage at range one. So during step eight, he'll charge forward and hit that mech. Again, monsters will target buildings or mechs. Uh, so that is how step four goes. And um, if a monster couldn't have aimed an attack from anywhere, what they would do is you'd look for what would what would be the the first thing they could attack if they had unlimited movement. So the thing that was closest to them, um, they would just move as far as they could in that direction, and then they, you would stand the meeple up to show they're not actually attacking this turn. So he would have just gone as far as he could, stood up, he would not be attacking. Uh, in this case, so once all monsters have aimed their attacks, we're going to move on to step five, detect. Uh, we'll come back and talk about this right after spawn, because this is the counterpart to spawn. Then is step six, player actions. So each mech can move and attack. So this is where I want to try to run around, stop the monsters, either kill them, push them around, push them into each other, redirect their attacks. Uh, so each mech has moved just like monsters do. They can move around the map. Um, you can use your attack. I can do this in any order, in any combination, you know, green and blue. I could go move with the green mech, move with the blue, attack with the green. And the catch is once a mech attacks, it can't then do anything else. So if green mech attacks, he can't then move. Um, so once I've used uh, both my max stun and moving and attacking I want, uh, then we would go on to step seven. Um, one other note is just uh, your max, uh, all units again cannot be on tiles with other units or obstacles. So you can't move on to buildings, you can't move on to mountains, can't move on to other units. I could go stand in water if I wanted, but I couldn't attack from there. Um, the other thing is that a lot of attacks, some monster attacks, but a lot of mech attacks will do other things besides damage. So in this case, uh, this attack also pushes the target. So if my green mech comes over here and does this attack, not only does it deal damage to the monster, which is tracked by their HP cubes, it would also push the target that moves things away from where the attack originated. So in this case, it would push it one space here. That is how you can move the monsters around, try to get them to attack each other, or push them into water, things like that. Um, if you try to push something into something else, again, things can never cohabitate. Uh, trying to do that results in both things taking one bump damage. So if I push this monster into this one, they would both take one extra bump damage. That's, that happens even as the monster dies, its body can still bump things. Buildings can also be bumped, which could destroy them and cause ruin cubes. So something to watch out for and something to utilize. So I'll put these guys back where they were. 
Uh, so step seven is effects. This is things like fire damage or map effects. Anything that has the effect keyword will take place during step seven. Um, so unless you've caused fire or something, you can ignore it. Uh, and then step eight is the last thing. Monsters will resolve their attacks. So based on where each monster is pointing, there should be exactly one thing it's doing. So you just go down the line and resolve all the attacks. So we would start here. The orange demon would deal its attack one damage at range one to this building, which would put a ruin cube on it. So that building is now destroyed. It's an empty tile. If I ever can't place one of these cubes, I lose the campaign. Uh, next, the herald would use its attack. It's going to deal one damage at range up to six. So it's going to shoot forward, put a ruin cube on that building. And then this Titan is going to charge forward as far as it can, deal one damage and push. So it would charge up to here, deal one damage to this mech, reducing its HP, and push it away. So that's how the monsters all resolved their attacks. Monster attacks are uh, stupid, so even if I push them around, change their targets, leave, and, you know, walk away from where it was going to shoot me, the monsters don't change what they're doing, they're all locked in. So that's something you use to your advantage. So once I've resolved all those attacks, then I just wrap around back to step one. So this die would reduce again. Again, once I make it to where it would reduce to zero, I win that current game. So I'm trying to survive as long as I can to get, get that done. So talking about the two steps we skipped, let's start with uh, step five, detect. So this is where monsters that are in the supply are going to be detected on the map, and then they will show up on the next turn. Uh, so there can be a maximum of four meeples running around the map. Um, there will only ever be three different types, but up to four meeples. So when you get to step five, you take anything in the supply, and you're going to put the cube on the map to show where it's going to appear next turn, and the meeple will go on a card to show what type of monster it will be. So you always start by detecting a monster whose type matches the card where the die currently is. So on this example, it, when I got to step five, the die was on the herald. So I would say the meeple goes on the card to show that the next monster that spawns will be that. And I will take this and put it on the spawn tile that matches the die value. So in this case, it's showing a three. The spawn tiles are these tiles with the red numbers. Uh, you'll notice they go up to eight. And there's actually some duplicates. We're gonna ignore the, the numbers on the edges. The outer edges are ignored. That gives you eight remaining numbers on these eight tiles here. So I would put the purple detection cube on spawn tile three. Then uh, during the spawn step on the subsequent turn, step two, you just switch all meeples with their cubes. So in this case, the purple herald would appear there and I'd put his cube next to the other cube on the card. They spawn with full HP. And uh, when I'm activating these, not only do you go cards from left to right, you can also do the HP cubes left to right. So just treat these as sitting next to each other. And uh, if, if one dies, just use the track for the remaining one. Uh, so that's how spawn and detect works. Uh, one other note is there should only ever be up to two meeples associated with a card. So if I already had two heralds and I was spawning something, even with the die there, I would skip to the next card, wrap around if needed. So you shouldn't have more than two meeples associated with any card. All right. So that's the, the whole turn order. Um, I'll talk about something else is some attacks you'll notice um, will create status dice. That's these three extra dice. So when something creates a status die, you just take the die, place it where the status was created and set its value equal to the status that was created. So for example, forests, when someone deals damage on a forest tile, it adds fire there. A fire die is, you can see that's die three. So you take one of those status dice, set it to three, put it on the forest. What those uh, statuses do is all listed in the rules. Um, there are a max of three that can be on the map at any time. Um, if you would create a fourth, just take one of the others away, your choice. And uh, if some, some of them are attached to units and move around, if you ever have a unit with a status die that moves onto a tile with a status die, uh, there's a maximum of one die per tile, so you just get rid of one of them, your choice again. Uh, brief overview, the rock is a, just a status die that serves as a one hit point obstacle, it sits there, blocks the tile. Um, number two is smoke, so the deserts will generate smoke, and anything standing there can't do its attack from that tile. So monsters, when they're trying to aim attacks, they know they can't aim from there, they'll go somewhere else. Uh, number three is fire, that uh, attaches to the first unit that stops on the tile, so I can move through it, but if I stop there, fire will attach to that unit. From then on, it will uh, move around with the unit, and during the effect step, step seven, um, I, will, I will deal one damage when I'm on fire. Uh, the number four is frozen. Some things will freeze units. So 
This one is only ever attached to a unit, and that unit can't move or act while it's frozen. Any damage will break the ice, but the unit won't take anything. So it's covered in ice. If I, if I attack it, instead it breaks the ice. Um, that's a good way to lock down monsters, or sometimes even uh, you can actually freeze buildings. It's the only status die you put on buildings. So frozen buildings are protected from their next hit. Number five is a shield. It's kind of like frozen. Um, it stops the next hit and goes away when it when it prevents the damage, but it doesn't stop you from moving or attacking. So some mech attacks will shield them. And number six is acid. That one also attaches to a unit like most of them do. It increases attack damage to that unit by one. So nothing uh, bump damage, fire damage isn't increased, but if I deal attack damage, I add one because of the acid. So that is how the status dice work. Um, so you win the game by surviving those five turns. Once you do, you're going to reset the turn die and advance it to the next game. So you'll start the next game with a turn die at six. And you would re-randomize the map, front, back, left, right. You would re-randomize all your monsters. Uh, the mechs will stay the same. You use the same two mechs for the whole campaign. Um, when playing the campaign, you're also going to activate any of these map effects for the game you're currently playing. So game one, I would have activated the triangle effect on the left map card and the star effect on the right map card. So I look at the left map card, I see the triangle gives me a goal to block two monsters from spawning, and the right one has this star effect goal, inflict two monsters with acid, and I can see that units on these middle two tiles are automatically have acid dice added when they go there. So those goals are things I want to try to accomplish. I'll always have two goals in each game, and uh, if I do accomplish them, I get the list of rewards. So for accomplishing that triangle goal on the left card, I would get reward A, B, or R. And I can see the, the goal, sorry, the rewards are listed down here. So A is an upgrade for mech A, B is for mech B, and uh, R lets me get back a ruin cube. So at the end of a game, any ruin cubes on the map leave the campaign. So you'll have that many fewer for your next game, but you can get them back through those rewards. The way the upgrades work is when I upgrade mech A, I just reveal the next row on mech A's upgrade rows, and they'll increase their stats. They'll give them a second attack so that when I'm trying to attack, I can have two options to choose from, um, or they'll just give them other effects, so they'll make them better. But also, as I'm going through these later games, the, the enemies are going to get stronger as well. So the dark blue box will show some effect that makes the enemies worse. So in game two, instead of starting with three monsters, as usual, I'll actually put all four on the map to start with. And then starting from game three, you begin using these alpha monsters. So the alpha monsters use the lower panel here with higher stats, usually worse attacks. Uh, you'll use the right side HP track so that I know, okay, orange is an alpha monster. It's on this HP track. And uh, the alpha count for each game when I'm spawning monsters, if there's fewer alphas than what is shown in that number right there, then I will spawn alphas until I hit that number. So in game four, for example, the first two monsters that spawn will be alphas if there's none on the map. And after that, normal monsters spawn. Uh, so that is how the campaign works. If I win the finale game, uh, then I win the whole campaign. If I lose uh, both my mechs, or if I ever can't place a Ruin Cube, I lose the whole campaign. Uh, so that is everything you need to know to play. And I'm going to loop back around and talk real quick. So for your first game, I said to just set it up as shown, but in subsequent games, the way you should really do it is you'll just do a bonus detect step. So you'll have you'll roll that die, you'll set it on the first monster card, and then you will uh, spawn your first three monsters immediately just like you would normally if you had had a detect step with that die showing. So it would have been, you know, the first monster on tile four, the second monster on tile five, and the last monster on tile six in this case. So that's how you can do a random setup for games after your first game. And that's the rules for Bury Me in the Rift. Thanks for watching.